grade 11, I joined the ski patrol. I was, uh, I think I was 16, 17 years old. And uh, from there, I got into the fire department briefly and then on to being a paramedic. And so I certainly owe my, uh, my life, my, my profession to my experiences on the ski patrol and uh, I wouldn't trade it for the world. So in discussion about what I was gonna chat about today, my idea was to make it fairly informal. I know it's hard to ask questions in front of a room like this, so I don't blame you if nobody puts their hands up, but if you do have questions, uh, you know, there are really no uh, bad questions to ask. So if there's any, anything that I can help uh, provide some clarity to, a bit of rationale around why we would do a, a certain protocol one way versus another way, if you do have any of those burning questions, uh, may not necessarily have uh, the answer, but I'll certainly try, and if not, I can certainly get it to you. So. Uh, super informal, and uh, uh, let's uh, let's chat about pre-hospital care because that's certainly uh, one of the things that I love chatting about. Uh, in in my profession right now, and and certainly in medicine in general, we're going through a major transformation. And I say that because when I started, uh, the protocols that I was taught on as a paramedic, uh, they were the the rationale behind those protocols was about 25 years old at the time that I was learning them. And if you think back to what uh, the paramedic service looked like back in the 70s, the 80s, and 90s, right up until the mid-1990s, there were still funeral homes in the province of Ontario that were also the ambulance service for that community. And if you called, and, and at that point you couldn't even call 911 because it didn't even exist. But if you called uh, the ambulance phone number that uh, I always would, would see at my parents' or grandparents' house, they'd have it written down, it was a, a regular phone number, Good luck trying to memorize it. You never would, so it was written by every single phone. Uh, you know, please fire ammo. So there were three different numbers. Uh, if you called that, you may have gotten uh, the funeral home. You may have gotten a private company that was uh, hired for that region. You may have uh, gotten the uh, the local gas station that happened to own the only hearse in town, uh, and they would come and pick you up. And if you didn't survive it to the hospital, they just take you over to the funeral home. And that, that was how it worked. And there, we used to have a saying, uh, you know, back then it was Bob, right? Bed, oxygen, and blanket. That was, that was the care. And all from a training perspective, all you needed was a first aid ticket, if that, and you'd be hired to, to be the ambulance for that community. So when we think about where we've, we've come from, that was, like I said, that was still up into the uh, late 80s, early 90s. If we look at where we are today, we've really had gone through a major, major shift. And it's really, there's not too many industries like this that have gone through that much change in such a short period of time. And if you look at the other emergency services out there, like uh, police and fire, uh, you know, there's a uh, number of firefighters in the room. There's literally 200 years of tradition, 200 years of lessons learned, 200 years of, of practicing and trying to improve and, and how to make things uh, as, as, as fast as possible. For us, we don't have that experience. We don't have that history to look back and say, you know, what worked, what didn't work, what are our lessons learned? So we're literally learning our lessons today uh, based on information that we did last week. So the change management is huge. And it's filtering down to the ski patroller. If, if, even uh, if you look at the ski patrol protocols, they're, they're changing a lot quicker than they ever used to be. For a long time, the manual that, that I, I see people have here today, for a long time, that manual never changed. It was the same manual every year after year that we would use. Um, and and that's, that's simply because in, in medicine and in uh, medical care and treatment and first aid and first responder training, uh, we were going off a lot of theory. Okay, there was some science behind it, there was a bit of theory behind it, and that's how we made our decisions on what our protocols would look like. Today is no longer the case. Everything we do today is all based on evidence. And the reason for that is we want to, we want to there's a, there's a drive in medicine, there's a drive in, in, in paramedicine to do things better. We want to do what's best for our patient. We want to improve the outcomes of our patients. We've gone to too many calls where people weren't surviving, we, weren't, we literally weren't saving anybody, and we want to change that. So today, everything is all about evidence-based medicine. And we're going through a number of big shifts. So in the early 2000s, uh, the CPR was the, the big change at the time. So pr prior to early 2000s, 
Uh, the, like I was saying, the CPR protocols were 23 years old at the time. All of a sudden they switched. And if you took a, a CPR course in the early 90s, you probably learned the old 15 to 2, 15 compressions, 2 ventilations. And then all of a sudden in 2001, it was bang. We're doing things completely different. And now today, if you take a course, depending on the, the, the level of, of training you're taking, they may tell you not even to do ventilations at all. And simply just do chest compression. So in the early 2000s, we did a lot of, uh, a lot of change management around CPR, uh, emergency cardiac care resuscitation. And now, the big shift is in trauma management. It's all about trauma today. And since we're here today, it's a, a field day. We're doing a lot of trauma scenarios out there. Uh, I kind of want to touch on a little bit of trauma because that's where the, the, the change is happening. How we, how we manage trauma patients and how we used to manage trauma patients is changing. And unfortunately, um, and I say unfortunately because these things have to happen from time to time, but unfortunately a lot of our lessons learned from uh, over the last 10, 15 years is coming out of our, the conflict zones in Afghanistan and Iraq and through the, some of the military experience with uh, medicine. So overseas they were dealing with multi-system multi traumas, multiple amputations, multiple significant traumatic injuries. And yet their survival rates in Afghanistan and Iraq are much better than they ever were in any other conflict that we've ever, ever been involved in. And really since uh, modern warfare began. So the change management is happening. It happened through those conflicts. And now we're seeing it on the civilian side. We're seeing it in, uh, in, in our civilian protocols. Um, I'm sure everybody's seen on TV. We used to, you know, a trauma patient would come through. We'd, hang, we'd start two big IVs. We'd hang all these IV bags. And we'd push a lot of fluid to try and bring the, the patient's blood pressure up. Well, what we find today is that actually the, some of that, that fluid that we're infusing into these patients is actually doing more harm than it is good. And we actually have a new saying for those, the, the, the fluid in, in those bags. Basically, that fluid is, is sterile water with a bit of salt, saline. So it's literally past the water is what we're infusing into trauma patients. And what we're finding is that we may get their blood pressure up for a little bit of time, but then when they get into the hospital, when they get into the ICU and into the OR, they're passing away. And we're trying to understand why that's happening. Why is if we can get their blood pressure up, if we can get their, their heart rate going, or, or we can stop that bleeding pre hospitally why are they still passing a week later or two weeks later, or even a month later in the hospital? And what can we do early on, even from the, the point of injury, that is going to potentially help save lives down the road? Just stop the leak. Exactly. We have, we have to stop the leak. So a couple years ago, actually, I think it was maybe three or four years ago, um, one, one season, we had a number of uh, traumatic cardiac arrests in the, in the Collingwood area. And Collingwood Hospital, as, as you know, is actually the second busiest um, hospital in Canada for fracture management. Obviously, because of the ski hills, they, they see a lot of fractures in that hospital. So they've, they've, they've definitely grown and, and they have a lot of experience behind them now. And that year, we had a couple of those cardiac arrests and some really bad calls. And there was some really, uh, and unfortunately, there wasn't a, we didn't have success with some of those patients. So the coroner got involved. Anybody here work for the coroner's office? No? Okay. Uh, the coroner got involved. And the coroner in Ontario has the authority to launch investigations to try and understand, you know, the cause of death and what can be done in the future to prevent these. So the coroner looked and said, wow, you know, we're getting all these traumatic cardiac arrests coming into Collingwood and these patients aren't surviving. What is going on? What is happening? And is there anything we can do to improve? So at the time I was, uh, I was working for the county uh, paramedic service. Uh, for those of you that live in the area, you know that the, the county line is actually goes right in between Collingwood and Blue Mountain. So Blue Mountain is actually in Gray County. Okay, so we had the Gray County paramedic service there. We had the Simple County service. Uh, we had the coroner, uh, we had the, the hospital. And we got together and said, what is going on? What can we do to make things better for these patients? And the underlying theme that came out of those discussions was, we need to communicate better. From a, from a hospital perspective, we need to understand what is taking place on the hill. What is happening at the point of injury that can be done or that, or, or that can be approved upon that is gonna change potentially that outcome of that patient, uh, not just in the emergency department, but like I mentioned, in the ICU, in the OR, and ultimately through rehab and, and to that discharge. 
So we looked at a couple of initiatives and uh, I, I'm sure there's a lot of pe people that are, are going to be patrolling in the Collingwood area. Uh, the Collingwood Hospital has a, has a significant interest in understanding that mechanism, mechanism of, uh, of injury. And so a couple years ago in some of the first aid training that was taking place and certainly in the research, there started, we started talking a lot more about things like the doctor's note. Right, getting that doctor's note out, documenting what we're seeing, what we're finding, what's wrong with the patient, what we're seeing, what, what, what are we observing on the hill that the, that the physicians, that the nurses in the hospital want to know. And, and uh, in fact, I, I don't, we haven't really used it at Craig Leith much. I'm at Craig Leith, but I know Blue Mountain uses it. There, there's a, a number, correct me if I'm wrong, but you can, you can call the, the hospital directly and, and talk to the, to the staff. And that's great because the staff there may want to reach out to us. It's a two-way communication. There are, there are some cases where they may want to reach out to us to, to better understand what, what, took, what has taken place. And I'll give you a couple, I'll give you two, two stories. I won't tell you all, all stories here, but I'll tell you a couple stories that really kind of bring that home to me. So in early 2000, uh, I think it was around 2002, I think, 2003, uh, it was four o'clock in the afternoon. It was a midweek day. There was only five of us patrolling at Craig Leaf. Uh, it was the end of the day, so we were all up at the top of the hill, ready to do our sweep at the, at the end of the day. It was, uh, there was a bunch of uh, private groups there that day, uh, a bunch of uh, uh, companies that had come out for a, a ski day. And uh, it was pretty quiet for the most part. We didn't have any accidents that day. And then all of a sudden, just before we start sweeping, we get a call saying that you know, we need ski patrol to outside the, ski, the, the, the lodge right away. We, we have an emergency, we need help. And that's all we knew. But we knew from the tone of, of the, I think it was a maintenance uh, person that called it in, we knew from the tone on the radio that we knew it wasn't good. So we flew down, we get to, we get to uh, the patient, they're just outside the lodge on the snow. Nobody around, except for the, the, the individual that called in and a couple of bystanders. And we asked what happened, nobody knew. They found him like this. The patient was laying in the snow, he was unconscious. We approached the patient, uh, we did our ABCs, and uh, because it's cold out, has anybody tried to feel a pulse on a patient outside in the snow? Have we, have we tried to do it this morning? It's not the easiest thing in the world, is it? And, and, and don't be, uh, don't worry if you don't feel a pulse on a patient, but they're breathing and walking and talking. Okay, it's uh, taking a pulse on a patient is extremely difficult. Okay, and if anybody tells you differently, they're wrong. Even doctors have trouble feeling for pulses on patients. Okay, so that's actually why they changed the guidelines to signs of circulation, signs of life, you know, it's a patient breathing, because that's actually more reliable than sometimes checking for a pulse. Okay, so we, we, we check the patient and the patient has what's known as agonal breathing. I think that's covered in the training. We talked about that in the BLS research, agonal breathing. Well, if you've never seen agonal breathing before, it will freak the hell out of you. It is something that you can't describe. It's, it, it's the, all you can tell from it is that it's not normal. It's not right. Patients should not be breathing like this. There's something wrong here and we gotta figure out what, the, what it is. Patient's blue, patient, like I said, the patient's unresponsive. So what did we do? Well, we started chest compressions. Started chest compressions, we got a, an AED from the, the first aid hut, we brought the AED out, we applied the pads, um, we got one, no, uh, one shock, put the pads on, the AED charged up, we got one shock of the patient. The next three analysis after that were no shock advised. Patient was still unconscious, we couldn't feel a pulse, so we continued CPR. So we're at the five, six minute mark of doing CPR. My gut feeling was this patient's probably not gonna make it, um, but sure enough, paramedics uh, pull up and uh, lo and behold, we can actually feel a pulse, like a really strong carotid pulse. So between that and the fact that the machine's uh, given us a no shock advice, well, like great, we've got, a, we've got a ROS, we've got a return of spontaneous circulation, which is awesome. But now you gotta think to the, think to the mechanism of this patient. So there, it was an unwitness arrest. There was no history of trauma. Okay, the patient didn't have his skis on. It's not like he skied out and ran into the uh, the ski racks, he was just literally found supine on the ground outside the ski racks. So we, uh, we, we tell the paramedics, yeah, we just found this patient, it was called in, we got to the patient, 
We gave the patient a shock on the AED, and then we did about six minutes of CPR before, the, before you guys got there. Paramedics say, great, no problem, sounds good. They load the patient to the ambulance, and they take off to the hospital. Okay? You gotta think, this patient's been down for about six, actually more than that, about 10 minutes. Probably at least 10 minutes of, uh, of, of no perfusion to the brain. Okay, so what do you think happens when the brain doesn't get perfused? Yeah, you lose consciousness, it dies, right? It starts to become hypoxic, right? It's not perfusing. So a couple things happen as a result of that. The patient goes unconscious, and weird things start to happen. Neurological things start to happen. So this patient, about halfway to the hospital, had a seizure. Went into convulsions and had a seizure about three minutes on the way to the hospital. Now, what do you think caused that? Do you think it was epilepsy or the fact that the brain didn't have oxygen for 10 minutes? Probably the fact the patient didn't have oxygen for 10 minutes, right? It wasn't like we uncovered some disease state that was going on in that patient for years, and now all of a sudden we found that the, that the patient's epileptic. No. The patient had a hypoxic seizure because they were in cardiac arrest. Okay? And if you think back to the BLS course, and because we shocked that heart, the heart was only in two rhythms. There's only two rhythms that an AED will shock. That's ventricular fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia without a pulse. Everybody remember that from the course? You know, the heart's just shaking. Okay, and we shocked that. The machines are designed to do nothing if the heart is not in those two rhythms. It will never shock a heart if it is on a VTAC or VFib. It, is, it, is, it, it will not do that. Okay? But, this, but think about it. This is in like 2001, 2002. Were there a lot of AEDs out there at that time? It's almost 20 years ago now. No, there was hardly any. And in Collingwood, outside of the ski resorts, there were none. So this patient comes into the Collingwood Hospital, and the doctors are like, wow, this patient has epilepsy. What else, could, what else could it be? That patient spent three days in the ICU on anti-seizure medication. Okay, because what else could it be? Right? That we, we did not do a doctor's note. We did not, uh, I mean, we told the paramedics what happened, but we don't know what the paramedics told the hospital staff when they transferred care to, to, uh, to the hospital. All the hospital could see is yet yeah, this patient was supposedly unconscious, had a witness seizure in front of the paramedics. It must be neurological. The fact that we shocked that patient of ventricular fibrillation in, in a relatively short period of time meant that from a cardiac perspective, blood work came back relatively normal. The 12 lead, EC, the electrocardiogram, relatively normal. So nothing really triggered. And, and at that time, we did not have actually the software to download the AED. So the machine doesn't have a printer. And since we didn't have that software, it took us actually about a week at the time to get the machine downloaded on the computer so we could actually see what the rhythm was. When we finally did that, the rhythm was coarse ventricular fibrillation. I had to take that actually to the, to the patient's family doctor. And three days later, he was in a, he was in a cardiac care center getting a bypass surgery. So that patient went from having a diagnosis of having a seizure to having a major cardiac issue requiring surgical interventions. Okay? And, that, and, that, and that's simply from a lack of understanding of what we were doing as a ski patrol, what, what the technology was there at the time, and the, and the transfer of care between us as the patrollers to the paramedics to the hospital. So that... That, uh, that, that one really kind of sunk in me. I'll never forget that call for sure. Fast forward it a couple years later. I, it, another midweek day. For whatever reason, the midweek days are bad. Um, but for whatever, whatever reason, it was a men's ski day. Okay, this is men's day at Craig Leaf. We were having a great day. The weather was beautiful. Life is good. We get a call for an accident on one of the hills. We ski down. I get to the patient, the patient's sitting on the snow. He's conscious, he's alert. He's sitting up and he's really short of breath. He is really short of breath, he looks sick. There's something clearly wrong with him, but he's conscious and he's talking to me. So what do we, what, what our first thing we ask? What happened, right? Patient says, I was skiing down, I caught an edge, I lost my balance, 
I ran into this tree here. Fair enough, okay? I do a quick check of the chest, and he's got a flail chest on the left side. Okay? I, I, um, he's, he's really short of breath. I do a quick exam. No, I can't see anything else. There's nothing else wrong with him. His pelvis is stable. The extremities are uninjured. Uh, like I said, his head was fine. He did not have any head injury. So we load and go. We get him on the toboggan. We get him down to, uh, to, the, to the first aid hut. We get him in the, in the patrol hut. Obviously, we've called for the ambulance at this point. But the ambulance gives us an ETA of 20 minutes. So we're sitting with this patient in the first aid room for about 20 minutes. He's short of breath. We have oxygen on him. And he starts to, he starts to crash. And we're doing everything we can. We, we, we're keeping him warm. We've got, the, like I said, we have the oxygen flowing. We're helping him out. But he's getting really sick. He's getting pale. He's getting diaphoretic. He's now he's getting a bit drowsy. He's getting confused. He can't really talk now. And I'm thinking that it's all chest, right? He's, he's getting a tension pneumothorax building. He can't breathe. This is, this, is, this is a problem we need to fix. A few minutes uh, go by. At this point, he's now unconscious. So now we start to bag him. And we're, we're ventilating the patient. A few minutes after that, the, the ambulance rolls in to the parking lot. We move him over to the stretcher, and now he's in cardiac arrest. Okay, so we start chest compressions. We, uh, I jump in in the back of the ambulance with the crew. We're, tra I'm, we're helping doing CPR. We transport to the hospital. We do CPR the whole time. We hook up the AED. What does the AED say? No shock advised, right? Because it's not a heart problem, right? It's a traumatic problem. So the, the trauma is what caused the cardiac arrest. Okay, because that, that becomes important. So we get into the hospital. I'm, remember, I'm there. I'm in the emergency department. I've got my ski patrol outfit on. And at the time, wearing a ski patrol outfit in the emergency department doesn't give you a lot of credit. Right? They weren't listening to me. I was just a lonely old ski patroller. There's a, there's a surgeon sitting in here. I, 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 I tell the hospital staff exactly what happened. The patient was conscious when I got to the patient. I told him, he told me what, what happened to him. This is what we did, and now he's in cardiac arrest. The doctor turned to me and said, I don't believe you, this was a cardiac, this was a cardiac issue, you had a heart attack, and that's why I hit the tree. And we're gonna treat this as a cardiac arrest. So everything that they did for that patient was to treat the medical, uh, presumed medical cause of that cardiac arrest. They gave that patient drugs, they gave that patient interventions related to the medical cardiac arrest protocol. Nothing that they did to that patient was, a, was, was intended to address the, the, the traumatic nature of that, that injury. Unfortunately, that patient died. They did the, the post-mortem on that patient. It actually came back. It wasn't actually the chest that killed him. He actually uh, tore his spleen and, and bled out. And it was a splenic injury that actually uh, caused the cardiac arrest. But it was a traumatic cardiac arrest. And, what, and how was that patient managed? By a, a medical protocol. Okay, and you know what? As, as unfortunate of that, um, as fortunate of that as that was, the reality is that's medicine. Me medicine, pre pre hospital medicine, what we do on the hill, first response, first aid. As much as we try and make things a, a protocol and make things very black and white, the reality is is that everything we do is in the world of gray. How I treat a patient on the ski hill is going to be different than how each one of you do it, and vice versa. We'll, we will do our best to follow protocols. We will adapt to the situation in hand, and we'll do what's in the best interest of the patient. Because that's what we're all here for. Everything that we did in both of those cases, we did it out of wanting to help that patient. And the hospital did everything they want at, in their, uh, on their end to help that patient. Okay, so we're all in the same boat together. Things are going to happen on these calls that when we look back, it was like, wow, that was a, we should not have done that. That was bad. And, 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 and that's okay. It's medicine. That's how we get better. That's how we improve. That's why we're here today doing training. Because we'll, we, will, we will practice today to take away all the doubt of what we're doing. Today is about confidence. So when we get to that patient, regardless of how severe their injuries, we know what our actions are, are going to be. And in those two cases, 
the outcomes were poor, but it improved the system. Because now we have a better communication with the hospital, we have a better rapport with the paramedics, the paramedic services understand our protocols, the hospital understands our protocols, and we understand what they're doing. And we're gonna work better together. If we had that call tomorrow, I'm pretty sure it would be managed differently than it was when we did it. And that's exactly what we're all here for. We will improve upon what we do. Every call, every patient that we touch, we will learn from. Even if it's just a stub toe. I will learn to do a better assessment on a stub toe from the last time I did a stub toe. Okay, we will, we will learn and get better on what we do. And we will make mistakes along the way. We all make mistakes along the way. And, and we will reflect on that. And, and the only way to get past that is not to dwell on the fact that, you know, we didn't do a, 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 a better job for that patient. Uh, we, we won't, what we will do is we will focus our efforts on getting better for that next patient. My first patient as a ski patroller, I was seven, like I said, I think it was, yeah, 17 years old. It was an early, early uh, ski season in December. Um, uh, there was an old patroller, Dave Smith. He, he's been there for years. Um, he was there and uh, they called for a ski patroller in the first aid hut. I'm 17 years old. I'm, I'm fresh out of the first aid program. I, I was all jacked up, ready to go. I, I thought this was it. So I run in there and there's a little kid in there, a little boy, and he's got a fractured tip fib. That's all. It's a fractured tip fib fracture. He's laying on the couch. He's fine. Right? He's not bleeding out. There's no, no tourniquets are required on this patient. Okay? He's GCS 15, his mom's there. And I had no idea what to do. <laughs> I walked in there and I froze. Because I thought this, yeah, this was, I one look at that leg and I was like, wow, I'm out. <laughs> and thank God Dave was there because Dave, Dave, was, Dave walked in a few minutes later and I'm like, Dave, I don't know what to do here. It's bad. It's really bad. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he goes, no worries. No worries. It's all good. It's all good. Has a, you know, walks in very cool, calm, collected. Talks to the mom, you know, hey mom, how's it going? You know, what happened? Oh, he, he fell, yeah, twisted his leg, no problem. We get the cardboard splint out. We didn't have the yellow speed at the time. We get the cardboard splint out, throw a couple of triangles on it, in and out, 15, 20 minutes, paperwork done. Kid was fine. And, uh, and I looked at Dave and I was like, that is the coolest thing I've ever seen. And, and from there, it, it, the rest was history. And, 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 and having, that senior, having, having that senior patroller, uh, and we talked about this a little bit before I came up, having that senior patroller there to, to help you through that first couple of accidents, uh, especially if you don't have a, a medical background, uh, really means the world. Uh, it certainly helped me out for sure. Um, but in the absence of uh, having anybody around, like if Dave hadn't come through that door, okay, at, at some point, it felt like forever for me, but it was probably about maybe 30 seconds before Dave walked in. I would, have, I would have at some point thought back to my training, thought, you know, reflected on what I did uh, on days like today, and realized to myself and told myself, hey, we gotta, we gotta get our act together and, and help this patient out. And I would have gone through my assessment, we would have, I would have splinted that leg and done exactly what Dave would have done. And, and that's because of the training that we get here. The primary assessment, the assessment that we do, um, I use that ski patrol primary assessment in, in everything I do. Whether I, as a paramedic, whether I'm, I have my military uniform and I'm in the field with an infantry unit, I use it at exact same patient assessment. And I've used it ever since I started patrolling, because it works. And if all else fails, if I black out and, and freeze up, I will revert, revert back to that protocol and just walk through it. And it won't be pretty, it won't, it won't be, if somebody was watching, it won't be smooth, but I'll get it done and, and we'll, we'll do what's best for the patient. So it works. That protocol, if, you, if you're, that patient assessment, if you feel like you, that's foggy, if, if I had to practice one thing, it would be that. Your assessment skills are your number one thing that you can practice on. Because if you can ingrain that to memory, you will revert back to that if you're unsure of everything else. 
and, what, and, and that will ground you in a call, especially a very serious call. That protocol will ground you and it will allow you to focus on, uh, on the other bigger things at hand. Okay. And just like everything else, before I, before I wrap up or if you have any questions, is as I mentioned earlier, we're in a bit of a trauma revolution right now. Okay, the, the early 2000s was cardiac, now it's trauma. We don't know what the next kind of big thing out of, the, out of medicine is going to come. But what we do today may be different than what we do tomorrow. So just remember that, okay? Don't, be, don't, don't get fixated on, this was the way we've always done it. Because tomorrow, it might not be. I foresee a world pretty soon where if we have another traumatic cardiac arrest and there's no external hemorrhage that, and it's all internal, we may not even be doing chest compressions on that patient. There's studies out there right now that are looking at that. So things like that are, are coming. Oxygen. We talk a lot about use of oxygen. Okay? There are actually very few patients that require supplemental oxygen. Very few. Okay? It is not a cure-all. And as much as you've been told, it does not affect your hangover status. Okay? If it does, it's all psychological. Which is okay too. The placebo effect is a real thing. And it works. But medically, it does not change anything. Okay. 